All right. Well, let me, uh, we're in week two of vision series called Remnant. Let me recap on kind of where we were at last week. We talked about just the general overall mission statement of our church, which is to be a holy people uh, in Holly Springs. And the idea being that we are set apart for God's purpose here in Holly Springs to be a remnant of faith, no matter what spiritual or cultural forces may push against us, that we will remain true to the way of Jesus and let him build his church on that and the gates of hell will not prevail over it. That's our hope. And so to be a set apart people, holy people in Holly Springs. And today we're going to talk about our vision for formation as a church. So if you have a Bible, go to Romans chapter 12. And uh, we're going to talk about our vision for formation. We are going back to these famous verses in Romans chapter 12. Maybe some of you guys have heard them, but hopefully I'm going to unpack them in a way maybe you've never thought about or heard them talked about before. And the reason why that we're studying this is the groundwork of the vision for formation is because the vision statement for formation at our church is this. To see God bring out the best in people while forming them into mature believers. Okay, so our vision for formation is that uh, God would bring out the best in you, which we believe is actually being a well-formed, uh, mature believer in Christ. And, and the vision comes from these verses in Romans 12. Garrett and I, our former associate pastor, um, were talking about our vision uh, together up here in the balcony, right outside of my office. We were just sitting at a table. We were talking about the vision, and we are talking about the idea of formation. He said, Do you... Uh, have you ever read what Eugene Peterson wrote in the message translation uh, in Romans chapter 12 for those for Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 and I said I don't I don't think so and so he he took me there and he read this to me he said this so here is what I want you to do God helping you take your everyday ordinary life your sleeping eating going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So this is where we get our vision for formation. The, the NIV reads those same verses this way. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. In the Greek, the word bodies tended to mean all of who you are. Which is why Eugene Peterson says all those ordinary things of sleeping and eating and walking around and going to work. All of those things, the ordinary parts of life, they're a part of all of you. He's saying give all of yourself to him. This is your true and proper worship. Which is holy and pleasing to God. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Right? He's saying do not come so well adjusted to the culture. That you just go along with it without even thinking. But he says instead, but be transformed. That word transformed in the Greek is uh, like metamorphoso or something like that. It's, it's, it means metamorphosis. It means to be transformed from the inside out. And so the idea is that we're transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve of what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Who doesn't want that, right? Now, here's the thing is that I'm going to give you a little bit of oversimplification. What Paul's talking about here is he's talking about spiritual formation. And he says that spiritual formation takes place with a renewed mind. Uh, and that renewed mind is one that specifically starts to think more like Christ than less like the world. All right. That's an oversimplification. We're going to talk about how we get there. In just a second, but my running theory and my working theory is this, that, that ultimately formation is primarily a result of a re, uh, renewed mind that only comes through being with Jesus. Now, you can only have this renewed mind or find this renewed mind in being with Jesus because only in being with Jesus can you get to know Jesus and in getting to know Jesus, understand the way that he lives and the way he thinks. And so you can't do this outside of his 
presence and having a deep abiding relationship with him. And this should be your primary concern as a believer. You may have other thoughts. You may have like other dreams. You may have other visions for your life. You may be thinking to yourself, my vision for my life is to be such a great mom and such a great dad that I raise biblically sound children. And that's great. That's a great vision, but it shouldn't be your primary vision. Your primary vision for life should be to become like Jesus. That's what he wants for you. That should be all of our desires, to be more like him in order that little by little the world might actually see the incarnation of Christ through us and his kingdom may come here on earth as it is in heaven. That's the hope. And so, does this all, this all make sense? None of that can happen without being in his presence. None of that can happen without being in his presence. But in order, right, to... To get there, in order to renew our mind, in order to fix our attention on God, is the way Eugene Peterson says it, in order to get there, there's an immense thing that we have to understand. Why is this so important? Why is it so important that we have a renewed mind? Well, the, the most important reason is because our thoughts control our feelings, and our feelings control our behavior. This is what uh, Dallas Willard says. Thoughts generate feelings. If we allow certain thoughts to obsess us, then their associated feelings can enslave and bind us. That is, take over our ability to think and perceive. So he's saying when your thoughts lead you in a certain direction, especially an unhealthy direction, you start to feel unhealthy emotions and you start to feel things that are not healthy things to be feeling. And what you end up doing is you stop to you, you cannot discern or perceive what truth is or what the will of God is anymore. And your actions just follow the way that you're feeling. You become captive to your feelings in this. You become slave to your feelings in this regard. And you start to live in your false self instead of a more well-formed image of Jesus. He adds this. He says, feelings are, with a few exceptions, good servants. But they make disastrous masters. Meaning that feelings are really, really good things. They're actually, we should be in tune with our feelings and how we feel at any given moment in any given time. They're what, they're what push us. They're what kind of prod us. They're what move us. They're what touch our heart and our soul, those feelings. But we use them as servants to our end goal of being conformed into the image of Christ not let them master us and lead us further away from being like Jesus. Does that make sense? So we can't let them master us. We can't become slave to our feelings. They're not bad, but if they take control, if we don't hold them in check, they will move our lives completely out of the order in which God wants them to be. This is why Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This is why we, 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 the reason why we take every thought and make it captive and obedient to Christ is because this is how we keep our thoughts and our feelings in check so that we can continue to move toward being like Christ instead of being like the rest of the world. We can think like him. But again, you can't make every thought captive to Christ if you don't know Christ. You can't put it under his authority if you aren't abiding and being with him. Like I said last week, the only thing that's going to make us the holy, the, the thing that's going to be most tangible at least, and making us the holy people that we want to be, is the presence of God. Being with him and him with us. That's how we get to know him. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew, or John chapter 15, sorry, not Matthew, but John chapter 15 says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. And the harsh reality of a lot of people who are followers of Jesus, who fail to live with this renewed mind and fail to be formed to the image of Christ, is, is because they live life disconnected from the vine. And in turn, they're trying to produce fruit out of their own will, out of their own power, out of their own wisdom, instead of the power and the will and the wisdom of God and his spirit, which he has given to you because he loves you and he calls you to walk with. We should walk in step with his spirit. And once we walk in step with the spirit, with our attention fixed on God and fixed on his goodness, 
our mind has been renewed to focus on Him by being with Him, then and only then will our minds truly be renewed and will we begin to actually look and resemble the image of Christ. Does this all make sense? Okay. So, that is the, that is the kind of the, that's kind of the um, how or, or what, maybe, um, and, and a little bit of the why. Let's talk about um, let's talk about tangibly, how do we get there? How do we renew our mind? How do we set our attention on God so that our minds may be renewed and we may resemble the image of Christ? How do we do that? Well, I want to go to Romans 5, all right, to start. So let's go to Romans 5. If you have a Bible, go to Romans 5. And we're going to look at one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It's the very beginning of Romans 5. It's so beautiful. I love what Paul does here, he just, I wish I could write like this guy, you know what I'm saying, like when I read, when I read, I'm like, gosh, why can't I write better, um, Romans 5 verse 1, it says, therefore, since you have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, what he's saying is you've been made right with God through faith. Which means that, that instead of letting sin separate you, you've been brought to peace. Peace is wholeness. It's harmony. You now have harmony with God through Jesus Christ, through whom you have gained access by faith into this grace in which you stand. So you're standing in the grace of God, and what that ultimately does, it allows you to be in the presence of God. It allows you to be with God because of His goodness and because of His grace, because He loves you and died on the cross for your sins. He says, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. He says, we boast in the fact that one day we have this hope that the glory of God is going to be ours. That we're going to be before God, face to face, with all the angels, bowing down, yelling, holy, 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 right? That's the future that we have as Christians. We should really be excited about that. I mean, you guys are kind of like, you guys are white people in church. Y'all need to get excited. Like... If I would have said that in an African-American church, they would have been standing up and like super happy about everything I just said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. All right. So here we go. All right. It says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character hope. So what he says, he says, we, glory, we, don't, we, don't, we don't make a big deal about our suffering, the hard things that we have to go through in life. We don't let those things weigh us down because what they do is they produce perseverance and that perseverance creates in us a character. It changes us and transforms us into a better person. And it gives us more hope for the glory of God. Because we know that our present sufferings do not compare to the glory of God. This is, this is what he's saying. He says, and that hope, having hope in that way does not put us to shame because God loves, God's love has been poured out to in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. He's saying, you have, a, you have a stamp of God's approval. You have a stamp of God's love. You have a stamp of his affection. When you became a Christian, you were given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so as a follower of Jesus, you have this mark of his love and his approval. A stamp that he cares for you and that he loves you. It's been given to you. It's yours. So you have, you have this way of living. Now, let me, let me break this down, okay? Um, you may want to take notes with this on the back of your program or a notebook or something like that if you have one. Or just take a picture of the board whenever I'm done. Whatever will help you remember it. But if you don't write it down in some way or take note of it in some way, you probably going to forget it. And I don't want you to forget it because this is the vision that we have for your life in formation. So I don't want you to forget it. But it's faith, right? Faith, what happens is faith leads us into grace. Okay? It leads us into the undeserved favor and love and forgiveness of God. That we believe that Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead. And in that we're given not what we deserve, but we're given something far better. We're giving something far better. We're given what? The hope. Of the glory of God. We're given hope that we get, no matter what we're going through, we have this hope that one day we have something better awaiting us because of the grace of God. Now, I want you to go back to Romans 12 for a second, where Paul says, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's grace, 
This is imperative. We have to have God's mercy and grace in view if we are going to have a renewed mind. Because it's his mercy and his grace that lead us to fix our attention on him and the hope that only comes in him. Does this all make sense? Now, in this hope, right, what happens is through this hope, we are introduced into his love. Through the Holy Spirit, we're given a glimpse of his love. Now, Christian love, this is a really important thing that we need to break down. Christian love or or love in the biblical context is all about the well-being of others. That is what Jesus expressed and displayed in himself. When When we talk about the love of Christ, what we're talking about is a love that is genuinely wrapped up in the well-being of others. And that is the love that we're called to bestow and carry throughout this world. Now, we mess this up sometimes. Sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we do a good job and we really stay focused on others in the church. There's a lot of times where we mess this up and we become very focused on ourselves. And when we become focused on ourselves, we begin to wonder, why is the church not, why is the church not meeting all of my needs? Or doing all the things that I need it to do. And the reason is because your mindset has flipped from the other to yourself. And if the church is going to work at its best, every member of its body must not be wrapped up in themselves. They must be wrapped up in the other parts of the body. They must be looking after the well-being and loving the other parts of the body. That's when the church, when everybody in the church is going to be satisfied and the church is going to be fulfilling what it's called to do, which is, which, which even says, like Jesus even says, like, like this love is how, like the world's going to know you're my disciples. You're actually going to look like me when you love this way. And here's, the Bible says that, that this love, this love casts out all fear. First John, it says that this love is perfected in us in this. Here it is. That Christ loves us. Okay, so he loves us. Because he loves us, we love Christ. Because his love is alive in us and we are loving him, we love others. And then others are loving us. <laughs> that is, that is, that's the four steps of perfecting love or the four parts of perfect love that casts out all fear. It starts with the fact that he loves us, shows up, dies on the cross for our sins, offers us salvation. Because of that grace that we've been shown, we turn and we love him in return and we carry his love to others and others respond to us in Love. This is how perfect love casts out all fear. This is how love is perfected in the church. But notice, it is always a self-sacrificial love. It is always a self-sacrificial love, meaning it isn't always easy. It isn't always the fun thing to do, but it is what we choose to do, and we choose to do it because we are grounded in joy. We love doing it. It's not easy. It's not. It's. It's really not um, always simple. Sometimes it's complex. Sometimes it takes a lot out of us. But we do it with joy. You can't truly love someone and not be joyous about it. You can't. These two things cannot live without the other. And so this joy, it fills our hearts and it becomes this, this unbelievable defense in our life, this joy. We cannot express or live in the love of Christ without it. And it becomes a defense when we feel weak or when we experience failure. I felt so weak this past Thursday, got some bad news and man, it was just so hard it was so hard, and I was struggling with some things, and I literally, I was sitting in that back row back there, um, just outside the door. I had my hand 
in my head in my hands, and I was just kind of at a loss. And um, and I just I had I was hopeless. I had I had lost joy. I had lost focus on God and His hope. I had put my hope in other things, and I could feel it. I could feel it, and those feelings were trying to tell me all kinds of things, all kinds of lies, and all believe all kinds of untruths, and take action on those untruths. And you know what I did? I remembered the Word of God. I remembered that the Bible says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Even when I'm weak, even when I'm experiencing failure, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That when I'm de- facing struggles, I'm, I can find the joy of the Holy Spirit. That when I'm in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is wrapped up in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That as mature believers are being formed into the image of Christ, no matter my circumstance, whether I have plenty or whether I have want, whether I'm in need, whether I'm hurting, whether I'm in pain, I can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Joy. Joy leads us to be able to love the way we're called to love. And thinking about the hope of Christ leads us to remember his love. And know it well. But this type of joy. This spirit empowered joy. That is manifest. It comes from real peace. It comes from a real peace. This peace isn't a reconciliation. Of broken things. As much as it is. A rest. In knowing how things will be. And the way in which you find this peace. And a rest. In in knowing how things will be. Is by keeping your, your attention focused. And your mind focused on the hope. That is in God. Do you see this? When I, when I have a hope and I know how things are going to turn out, I can always let my mind rest. In the midst of anxiousness and depression and turmoil and, and pain, how do I overcome those things? I, I remember the hope that I have. And that gives me peace. And as I have peace, I can live in joy. And as I can live in joy, I can then turn and love others and love God the way I'm, I'm, I'm intended to. This is, this is really what God says. I mean, this, if you want to know what, what are we defining as a mature, that's a mature believer. Well-formed mature believers think this way and look like this. They keep their focus and their attention on God. Their minds are renewed. But a lot of us are struggling, right? To have this peace, to have this joy, to have this love. A lot of important things in our life, they bog us down. Loved ones and their their our our finances, our health, like maybe there's a bad diagnosis or someone we know is near death. We worry about our appearance. We think and wonder what are other people going to think of us? We think about our future and what is our future going to hold? What is our kids' future going to hold? What is society's future going to hold? When I stand before God, is he going to send me away. like we think about these important these are all important things and we think about it. and the thing is if we think about them the way the world thinks about them we will probably think about them the wrong way start to feel things the wrong way that we're supposed to feel them and then we'll live the wrong way because we'll be controlled by those feelings and we'll follow those feelings instead of following what we know to be true in God and in Christ and if you're struggling right now to set your mind at peace, and you're worried about things, and you're, I, can I, can I just say, I, it's it's probably because you put your hope in the wrong things. It it starts here. If you're struggling to live at peace and joy and love, if you're struggling to look like Christ. There's, it's, it's likely because you've put your hope in the wrong things. And trust me, you're not alone. I had to be reminded of it this week. I'm so glad that God gave me this message for myself this week. Whether any of you guys needed it, I needed it. Because I had some hope in the wrong places. But if you're wondering how to attest and approve what God's will is, it's good, please, this is God's will for your life. 
That's his will for your life. That you would be formed into his image and you begin to think this way. You begin to live this way. If you go to Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says this, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. That you would know this love. John 15 verse 11 says that I have said these things or I've told you these things about what happens when you abide in me and I in you that that you might have his joy and that his joy might be complete in you John 14 verse 27 Jesus says peace I leave with you my peace I give you I do not give you as the world gives do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid Paul says in Romans 15, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is God's will for your life. It's all over the scriptures that you would be a people of love and joy and peace. And you find all of that by keeping God's grace and mercy in view that brings you hope that keeps you going throughout the rest of your life. And that's what a mature believer looks like. And that's what a renewed mind looks like. And that's the vision we have for you and your life and what we want to accomplish in you and in your life. And, uh, but, but, but it's our vision because it's God's will. And here's the thing is it's just a vision. It's just a vision. A vision, a, a vision is, is great in and of itself. Right? I mean, you want to learn how to speak Greek. Right? Or you just want to speak Greek. Let me just say it that way. You have a vision. You want to speak Greek. It's not going to happen with you sitting on the couch eating Cheetos, watching sports. (laughs) It's just not. Like, you have a vision. Like, I want to speak Greek. It's not going to happen. Until you act on your vision with some intention. You have to have an intention to act on your vision. And then you have to actually have means. So you, your intention is, I'm going to enroll in a class that teaches Greek. And the means are, I, they teach me Greek. Every Tuesday and Thursday from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And then those means lead to this vision. Does that make sense? So we have a vision for your life. Our vision is this, that you would be well-formed and mature believers that look like this and think like this through the renewing of your mind, that you might be able to set your mind um, on the hope that is in the gospel of Jesus. That's, That's really what it's about. But if you don't share this vision, you probably aren't going to want to come to church here. I I love you, but if you have a different vision for your life other than that, you probably aren't going to want to come here because we have an intention and we have means that we're going to try and help accomplish this. And we're going to try and get you like intentionally taking steps to go in that direction and handing you tools to help you go in this direction. If you want to know what those are about, then I would say come to our heart and soul class and I'll break some of that stuff down. I'll break down what kind of our intention and our means are to help you get to this vision. But... But you got to share the vision first. And I hope you do. Man, I hope you do. Because there is no better vision for your life. I have a quote up in my office. um, And it's a a really meaningful quote to me. Uh, It's by Dallas Willard, who I already quoted today. But it says this. It says, "The, The greatest thing God can accomplish in your life is not the achievements you achieve, but the person you become. The greatest thing God can do in your life is change you into the image of Christ. It is not about your achievements. 
It's not even, I mean, it's not even about how good of a dad or how good of a mom you are, or how good of an employee you are, any of those kind or citizen, like none of that. Because I honestly believe if you are formed in the image of Christ, you'll be great at all of those things. So our, our greatest vision has to be for the people we become. And we should desire more than anything else to become people who look like Christ and are formed in his image. But in order to do that, our minds must be renewed. Let's set our minds on the hope that's found in the gospel.